everybody, and welcome to the Roundtable Live podcast for November 17th, 2015. My name is Bear, joined by Mathis Games, Rockley Smile, and Northern Line. Hi. Hey, everybody. Hi. Hello. We are going to talk about some video games today. Bear, where was yeah. our countdown, man? I gave you a countdown. I gave you three, two, one. Gave us a super good countdown. I did. That time I was on the I was on the ball. He was dead on. I think this is the most prepared I've honestly been for any show. I had like the the whole docket is set up. Moobot's got the docket. We got stories to talk about. Stories. I was here on time. We're 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 you know three for three. The hope is that every week we'll get a little better. Something will come together and production values rise. Or we fall into a or we m- fall glorious into cataclysm. Yes, that's what we want. <laughs> the best way to end a podcast is to just go out in a blaze of glory. Yeah. You do Another it for day about, closer to death. Yeah, <laughs> you do it for like nine months, and then you get on Twitch for a few weeks. Everything just explodes, and then you're all dead, and it's, you rise from the ashes like a phoenix and start a new one, right? We'll call it the Pound Table Rodcast. We'll finally come through on the that. Pound offer. Table Rodcast. We've been waiting for forgot. that. No, that's that's been the that's been the whole build up this whole time. Uh, today's show, we're going to be talking about Tomb Raider's dismal performance thus far, which is kind oh. of to be expected. Uh, and then Microsoft kind of vouched for their release date as well, so that's sort of an interesting argument to be had. Uh, we want to talk about Fallout Four again because Fallout Four is a massive game, and we definitely need to talk about it a second time. Uh, the review event for EA's Battlefront, which is kind of an interesting yeah. mess behind that. We want to talk about that a little bit more, too. As well as the ridiculous Binding of Isaac Afterbirth alternate reality game that many of you may have been a part of recently. Uh, but I want to start by saying no one's actually good at Candy Crush, right? It's all just I'm made not. up. No one's actually skilled at Candy Crush. I don't think you can be skilled at it, can you? No. This isn't a news story, by the way. This is just a one-liner that I read that I thought was an interesting point. You can't be good at Candy Crush. And that's, that's it's not, it's not to say that Candy Crush is devoid of skill. It's just that no one can be good at it. Okay, I don't, that's I don't not going anywhere. Have you been, you've been <laughs> designed to be we do it? All right, listen, listen, listen. I want to save that one before it, it just be, becomes buried. Is, because I had this... a thing before the show, and I've, always, I've been trying desperately to remember it for the past 15 seconds. I have no idea what I wanted to talk about. You don't want to compromise your integrity or your faithlessness. <laughs> is really what's <laughs> important to you. Are these like the callback. Patreon rewards? Is just no, like, no. These <laughs> sentences? Because <laughs> they don't... They I don't s- form any coherent meaning. I swear to God I had an idea for this. I'm just going to close the article and move right along because really there's no saving that one. We're going to talk about Tomb Raider. (laughs) There you go. Rise of the Tomb Raider is now available on the Xbox One. An exclusive release for the Xbox One. We have uh, numbers coming out of the UK. Rise of the Tomb Raider has sold 63,000 copies. I wish you just said 63 copies. (laughs) Rise of the Tomb Raider has sold six copies in the UK so far. May as well be to them. Mm Mm-hmm. The, uh, the Tomb Raider 2013 release, by comparison, uh, was at 183,000. I believe those are also comparatively in the UK. Uh, day one sales numbers as well. But this, I mean, the, the bigger picture here, of course, is the fact that Rise of the Tomb Raider is competing with the biggest releases of the year by far. You've got Call of Duty Black Ops 3 that just came out, and of course Fallout 4, which is the big one that everybody's been talking about, which was released on the exact same day, basically. Yeah. As a uh, Tomb Raider, and and not exclusive, also. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say the exclusivity is, it's gotta hurt it, right? Like on the Xbox One, uh, it's not the most owned console out of all of them. Mm-hmm. It's unfortunate. I don't know. I, I, just feel I don't like know it if it's locked. even really an issue of whether or not they even chose the right console. I think the console exclusivity in well, general is gonna be in general, yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Just not exactly the best play. The I think the argument that I want to make to to start off the conversation is that. They just shouldn't have released this year, I don't think. At all. I don't think You're they saying, should have released this bayonetta. year. I think, yeah, Jan- do a little January, bit of a bayonetta, February. wait until January or February of 2016. I think this should have been the big first release of 2016. Yeah, I don't and think that would have been a bad idea. Not exclusive. Would mm-hmm. have actually totally changed the whole perspective. Well, we don't know right. how much money Microsoft shuffled in their direction 
to make that happen, you know? Well, true. And last year, even, we were talking about how this would likely lead to increased sales and a good result for Rise of the Tomb Raider. But admittedly, last year, we didn't know that Fallout 4 existed and was going to be yeah. released on the same day. So that kind of changed the game. That's what I'm looking at right now is the idea that... Um Maybe Tomb Raider was like, we're coming out November 10th, and then Bethesda announces Fallout at, like, the end of May, or the start of June, I can't I guess it was the start of June, mm -hmm. and uh, they're like, oh, shit, I really hope they don't pick the one week that our Tomb Raider game releases, and then maybe they did, and they were like, shit, we're, like, so close to launch. Right. Yeah, maybe we, it's too late. Maybe we shouldn't delay it, but, um, yeah, it looks like the Tomb Raider release date was announced on June 15th, and the Fallout 4 release date was announced on June 15th. Oh. So maybe that yeah. was just like really, really, <laughs> really shitty timing sense. for them. It must I can't imagine that. Done. I can't imagine the people at Square Enix were like, oh, well, we can beat Fallout. Mm. Right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that this is just like an unhappy coincidence for them. If it weren't, would you think it could possibly work in the other direction that Bethesda could have actively tried to subvert competition by saying, let's just crush them on the same day? Oh, I don't think Bethesda gets anything by. You're coming out on the same day as Tomb Raider. Yeah. No, they probably yeah. don't. I'm just wondering if that's like a strategy you think for anybody. I don't know. Maybe it just seems it seems like kind of rude. Kind of shitty. <laughs> <laughs> so like, it, it seems like like something a sports team would do is like you know right. claim someone off waivers mm -hmm. when they don't actually need them just to hurt their opponents. Yeah, I don't right. know if. If Bethesda's like, no, we gotta fuck Square Enix. They didn't even want to fucking release it this year, man. They were just like, you know what? Just fuck them over. We can do this. We can I ruin hate their company. Crops. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I've heard the game's actually not bad either. No, it's actually it, very, very good. Sucks because yeah. I want to play it now, but I don't want to buy an Xbox. So, yeah, this... well, it's only timed exclusivity, right? Yeah. It's gonna hit everything else when in a few months. But yeah. will the next release matter? Yeah, like, exactly. Will it matter still around? at that point? I I argue it won't. It it really would have just. Obviously, they can't fix the exclusivity now, right? We were talking about this, really it was last year, like August of last year was about when this news was coming up, that Rise of the Tomb Raider was going to be a console exclusive, and it sounded like a good idea at the time. But now, they still have the exclusivity to deal with, but I think as recently as just like a few months ago, I don't know exactly when the game went gold, but it's still worthy of consideration, knowing what you know now, to think, well, maybe you, oh. we... Ooh. Well, not even maybe, we won't compete, you know? Like, we won't be able to compete yeah. with this launch. It yeah. just, we're not even well, on the is, same scale. I'm, I'm, on a, I'm on a PC Gamer article right now as far as, like, when they're going to launch. It's, like, bad. It's, like, staggeringly terrible. Mm. So, PC's release is sometime in early 2016. PS4 release is holiday 2016. So, oh. a whole year between oh, yeah. the Xbox One and the PS4 release date. They're gonna That's, try again with the PS4 next point. year, I guess. Everybody who's gonna want to have played it for the most part, I feel like we'll have played it on the PC or something by then, and or people just won't care anymore. Yeah, exactly. And uh, that's what we said awful. about Grand Theft Auto V, right? When it came out staggered, but then again, they kind of upgraded but, the visuals and hardware along yeah, the way. Yeah, this time. is also not Grand Theft Auto V. Uh, yeah, it was the yeah. next point, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's really... I, I assumed they were both going to... PC and the PS4 version would come out around the same time, but... No, like, I'm, I'm alright with early 2016 for PC, because that's what I prefer to play it on, but, mm. I mean... Just to, to separate your audience that widely, I hope Microsoft paid them a lot of money. I well, do too. <laughs> the, what I've heard, and this might be hearsay, but is that Crystal Dynamics was basically only able to make the Tomb Raider they wanted to make because of the money that they got from Microsoft. Really? But even still, that kind of falls on deaf ears because it brings it back to that like 2013 discussion of like, how can this game be considered a failure? Failure, yeah, with two when million. When it sold, sold like nine million copies mm -hmm. or something like that. But um, no, I, I agree that like, I mean, what a, what a terrible way to have to reboot your reboot three years after you rebooted it is to just <laughs> like, oh my God. <laughs> To float out Spider-Man all over again. Yeah. It's like Spider-Man, or not Spider-Man, Tomb Raider 2013 comes out and is, everyone's like, this is probably going to suck. And then it comes out and it's awesome. And people were like, that's great. Second Tomb Raider comes out, people are excited. Comes out the same day as maybe the biggest game of all time. Maybe second biggest after Grand Theft Auto V. Um, Xbox One exclusive. Not coming to PS4 for a full year, not coming to PC for like four months. People were like, 
I, I just don't give a shit. Like, yeah. <laughs> like this doesn't bode well, I think, for the future of the Tomb Raider franchise right now. But maybe, maybe it's good enough to have legs on PC, even when it's you know four months old. Kind of feels like somebody else's secondhand stuff. And also, yeah. XCOM comes out in February, which I feel is like a game that could do really well on PC. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine if they know. sniped a second release date from them, like some other huge game came oh, in when the PC get date happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might be happening, you know? That's the other thing we have to talk about, too, is the fact that there really wasn't any good time this year for them to release it. You know? like it, it, we, yeah. we talk about the Fallout 4 comparison, obviously, but even as far back as just like a couple of weeks ago, they've got Halo 5's launch that they're competing with if they want to move it a little earlier. They've got Call of Duty just last week basically that was basically dealing with the exact same well, timeline and then now if they wanted to release it today or next week that's maybe not even in time for the holiday rush right you got to get in there like a month in, a, in advance of black friday even yeah yeah i guess you're right about that i was gonna say make it first week of december or something but yeah black friday is kind of huge so yeah i mean it, i yeah, think january february do that mm -hmm. I, th I think with this being such a big game it, it, it's it's a different argument i think just because this is tomb raider you know it's it's not some little studio this is a big yeah. project it may not seem like it when you compare it to things like grand theft auto and fallout 4 but you got to keep in mind those literally are two of the biggest game launches right. ever of the decade basically it's it feels like a january game doesn't it it feels like the the second tier of the triple a games like it's not mm. the grand theft auto or the fallout it needs to know it yeah. needs to level down from that and i think yeah. they do i think they realize yeah. that they just sort of didn't acknowledge it this year for some reason and they're they're being punished for it now in a very big way like these numbers are not good i feel like tomb raider is one of those games that there is like a a core of people who are actually really excited for it but then most yeah. people are kind of like i imagine we are where we're like well if there's nothing else coming out and it's apparently great i would play tomb raider yeah. but there's just no way to fit it in right now i actually yeah. really liked the the tomb raider reboot and it gets shit on for things that i don't normally have a problem with like quick time events i'm like they, they kind of fit in here like I, yeah. I thought that that was a pretty good game but uh you, like i have no motivation to play this to like go to the console that I like to play things on least and play this against right. another game like Fallout 4. Or even, like, for us, Afterbirth is still kind of in that position where I'm playing, like, the shit out of it. So, I don't know. It's just, like, it's terrible timing. I have to imagine that it was an accident. If it's not an accident, how in the world does that... <laughs> how, how do you say, like, yeah, we'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Fallout 4? I really think they're... It was probably just their worst nightmare, the way Fallout 4 kind of came about. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been planning this for so long that the introduction of something like Fallout 4 is just the, the, wor the worst case scenario that you fear having to deal with, I guess, in their position. And they did, and now everything's ruined, <laughs> more or less, but for them. Is it, is it ego that tells them not to move the date? Once you find out you're about to get stomped that day? It might just be even the difficulty of getting something like that done at this level. Yeah. You know? No, you're probably right. If you're an indie developer, you, you just say, oh, no, fucking we're, we're going to release in February. Not a big deal. But with these yeah. guys, 40 people probably have to be involved in the process yeah, of getting right. their Papers release date signed, changed. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I'm sure it's, it's crazy. Oh, no, I never implied it was simple. There's freaking marketing materials oh, yeah. already mm. ready to go and commercials being made and dates put on everything. When did they so. go gold, do we know? When did the Rise of the Tomb Raider go gold? Because if that was... If they didn't even finish the game until recently, maybe that would be another factor in whether or not it was, you know, a release date that they had, had in mind for a long time. Looks like October, October 9th. 9th. October yeah. 9th, okay. Hmm. No, I think... Man, that is... They had a lot of time to think about this. <laughs> they sort of... They just decided they could do it, you know? I, I, I can't really fault them for having the ambition. I also wonder, like, how much of it is also Microsoft saying you have to launch in November to yeah. sell as many mm -hmm. Xbox yeah. Ones mm -hmm. as possible? That might have been in oh, there Oh, that has well. got to be a huge factor. Yeah. Microsoft's they, probably they like, too, holiday don't season, they? we need to push them that's probably the biggest factor they probably said we're willing to throw you under the bus tomb raider so we sell more systems because we don't care about your franchise we bought your franchise basically it well, gives that them um, this holiday yeah it gives them a bundle as well yeah 
mm-hmm. that they uh, have been selling during the holiday season, if I remember correctly. Which you know that might be valuable for Microsoft. And to be fair, like isn't that what they get when they when they buy the exclusive? <laughs> yeah, right. Like, yeah. yeah. They yeah. get the, they there's get the a stake. there's a Tomb Raider console bundle. Uh, that's what I I thought I saw once then. Rise of the Tomb Raider Xbox One bundle. And so we probably don't have those numbers yet, but I I doubt that that's going to be you know a significant bump. Oh, oh maybe this is only a Canada thing. I'm oh, not sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. Four hundred and forty nine dollars. You get the uh, Tomb Raider in the definitive like the. Wait, I forget what they call it, the new generation edition, when they re-released it on Xbox One. I think it's and the also, on-fleek edition, actually, is yeah. what they're calling it now. The on-fleek? That's what the kids call it. Yeah. It is, and also, uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider. So you get both Tomb Raiders and the console, $449, with two asterisks uh, next to it. Mm. Which, yeah. <laughs> which means you don't actually get the console, you get smacked and in the face. They also did a thing where if you buy Fallout 4 for Xbox One, they give you Fallout 3. Yeah, as a download, so they're they're pushing that you get the old version of this too. And yeah, and on Xbox One you get mods on Fallout Four too. Do you? Yeah. Oh, that was so like a big announcement, I guess. And I'm also sure they have to be approved in some game. way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because mm-hmm. I mean, well, is that that's in something. place right now? That's what I was wondering. I don't know if it's in place right. I don't know if it's in place right now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, It'll this... be really interesting to see next year how much this affects the bundles and the sales of the Xbox One, if mm-hmm. at all. Because the system should probably be coming into its own by this point, I would think. With, I mean, yeah, with this being any indication, I really don't think that Tomb Raider is going to have much of a sway anymore. They might kind of be breathing their last breath if this doesn't pick up. To be fair to the Xbox One, they did, um, they had the highest sales in October, I think, of any of the consoles. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm Mm-hmm. And they've been like not neck and neck, but they've been doing relatively well uh, against the PS4 specifically. PS4, I still think, has many more you know units sold lifetime. But the Xbox One has some momentum. Where it came from, I have very the little drastic idea. Drastic price cuts around a whole bunch of big box retailers. They keep cutting mm. fifty or hundred dollars off of it for sales and bundling in a bunch of games. Halo, Fi- Halo Five probably. I was saying, I'm sure Halo too. Five was the best. Yeah. A big push. All the people who didn't buy an Xbox One for Master Chief Collection did we'll so pick now up one for, for Halo, Halo 5, 5. Yeah, with the game that actually works, you know, that's an easier sell, too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, games. I, th- I, think, I think we can attribute it to just sort of a... There, there was probably a mindset, a, a contingent of people that thought we really should consider moving this date, but then, you know, it was probably outweighed by A, B, and C of all sorts of exclusivity contract deals wrapped up into there's no way we can move this date. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I feel I mean, like a pretty pretty happy settling on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's I, I I kind of not that we have data to back it up, but I kind of like the um, I kind of like the theory that uh, Microsoft was like, I want we want a holiday bundle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So come out with it here. That's a great bundle game. You know, if you're basically getting the game for free and you were thinking about buying the console anyway, that seems good. But yeah, yeah. Uh, it sucks for Square Enix and Crystal Dynamics because how many people bought a boxed copy of like Amped? For their Xbox One, <laughs> that's that's the way I feel about it right now. It's like it really like devalues the the future copies sold of the game. I think or minimizes oh, the yeah. ability to sell them. Yeah. And then Amped comes out on PC, and everybody's like, "That's a shitty bundle game. Get that yeah. in the bargain bin. I don't want that." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> here's the here's the simple thing that I never really even really like think about it anymore, which is kind of it's kind of shitty. But honestly, I guess just my position has changed. I. Probably if I was a, if 10 years ago I was like looking at this as just someone who buys games and likes to play a lot of games, Tomb Raider coming out and it being $60 compared to, you know, so many other games that are coming out right now that all have that full price tag, I probably can't really afford to get Tomb Raider. And that, that alone is probably one of the biggest impacts is that not only are they competing with games that they don't really have either the marketing budget or really the overall hold on the gaming industry to compete against but they're also just straight up kind of devoiding people of the ability to buy the game like people do not have enough money to buy all these games so they sort of have to just make a determination that Tomb Raider is probably not going to be on the top of that list, it's, right? It's what probably one of the best holiday seasons for video games in a long time. It is, yeah. It's a, it's one of those like Tomb Raider. Maybe if it came out, this well, last was it last year that Tomb Raider came out? Was the year before? Twenty thirteen. Twenty thirteen. All right. So if this had, game had come out maybe last year, I don't remember anything huge coming out last year that would have been better. But this year, like, damn man, there's like yeah. so many good games coming out. I could, the other thing I feel like the. With uh, Tomb Raider 2013, they came, they came out with it in March, so 
March or May. So yeah. it was like, why you should just do that again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But hindsight is twenty twenty. Yeah. They chose to go the exclusivity route, and I guess that paid dividends for them. And they're, I guess, they're willing to trade the, you know, front loading that versus back loading it. Yeah, seems like it. Well, on the uh, on the flip side of that, Fallout Four is doing okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, <not> really. <laughs> weird, right? Weird. They sold a handful of units. Uh, looking like Bethesda launched. This is straight from uh, Bethesda Softworks press release. So you know we're getting the uh, the genuine article here. Bethesda launched with approximately 12 million units worldwide to meet day one demand. 12, 12 million. million. Yeah, that's sort of insane. Sales what in excess. What's that? What did GTA, what did GTA, GTA do? Then? I'm curious. Yeah. I remember reading a story. It was like a month after GTA's release, but they had shipped something like 33 million. Oh, my God. Which is, is not sales, but still. That's, no, this that's is, like, yeah, this is a comparison. You know, this is launched. 12 million units shipped worldwide. So that, you know, that's about the exact same. It's their biggest selling game of all time. But that's dude, mm -hmm. this article is so good. So we know that shipping copies doesn't necessarily mean they're sold. But yeah, probably, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of the copies are being sold. Uh, Fortune, you may know as being a magazine that lists the richest people in the world, has an article about Fallout 4 sales called You Likely Never Heard of the Best Selling Game of 2015. Who in the world knows <laughs> what video games are, but has never heard of Fallout? This is like a fictional person that only knows <laughs> Call of Duty and Madden. Yeah, like, right, exactly. Uh, only two video games exist, man. Jinx, Mountain Dew, and Eats Doritos. That's dumb. The best-selling game of 2015. You won't believe what's at number four. It's not <laughs> Candy Crush. Gamers oh. hate him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. It is doing well. Um, we're getting, like we've all had a lot more time with it now. Yeah. So what is people's thoughts? Okay, so I haven't even gone to Diamond City yet. And, okay. Uh, I'm about 25 hours in, I'd say. I've I've been putting a decent amount of time into it now, and I uh, I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to get into the sanctuary and the settlement building in a big way, actually, because I've leveled up my character with those local leader perks. So now I can you know build shops and have supply lines connecting things and i'm a little disappointed in it in in the overall sense i i don't necessarily like the the way you build things i think nick mentioned this before the show was starting that yeah, they, they need like a grid system you know to actually yeah. give and you the defense uh, that i hear is well it's supposed to be janky because it's post apocalyptic it's like no. okay that's fine mm. for you i like building on a grid <laughs> a and i would take the time I, if I was role playing, if I was that dude, yeah. I would still line up ninety degree angles because I care about that as a person. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I know go it's ahead a nitpick; and... it doesn't really matter, but it bothers me personally. And I know a mod will solve it in five seconds. Let's let's not argue for like preserving the realism of apocalyptic shelter building. Like I'm okay yeah. with having uh, radiated dogs that l lunge at my jugular. Let's let's yeah, let yes. that be representative of the apocalypse. Let me build on a grid. Still, we can have both. We can compromise on that. Uh, the uh, yeah, but I mean that that part of it is definitely still compelling. Like I I'm I'm still interested in building out my settlement, which obviously is not even really the game. Which is yeah. the craziest part. I, I've spent probably 40% of my time playing Fallout 4 and not playing Fallout 4 Settlement Warrior, which, which has been my favorite game. Admittedly, I was about to say, like, my condolences. <laughs> but that is, I, I have to accept that not everybody is into it for the same reason I'm into mm. it. But I find the settlement stuff really tedious and annoying i think you're yeah. outnumbered in this group too aren't you as far as that's concerned no, that's fine i accept that mm -hmm. um but i kind of hate it and <laughs> i love the the gunplay i'm fine with the dialogue although i am running into some stuff with like madness was talking about that it not having more dialogue options is getting a little lame but um the gunplay and the combat is awesome but whenever i have to do something in the settlement i'm like fucking so like i get a <laughs> companion and i'm like punished because they went back to Sanctuary, I've got to build, like, a new bed and right. add an addition onto the house. Yeah. And then, like, the walls don't snap on right. Like, they're snapping on at 180 when I need them to snap on at 90 degrees. And then people were like, oh, you got to put a floor down. Okay. So then I delete everything, put a floor down. But then the floor is now on top of the bed because they thought that I wanted to place I the floor I swear to God, everything there. just elevates yeah. by default. It's just yeah. ra raised off the ground by five inches, and that's just the normal expectation. 
The only, like, I've put a, probably a lot of time into crafting, but the only project I really am enjoying is I'm building, like, a, um, like a hanger for all my power armor. All right. <laughs> yeah? That's yeah. good. So that's, like, the big thing that I've got is, like, this big hanger, and I've got all these power armor stations and, like, lights in between, and I have, like, different power armor yes. setups. It's, like, completed on one side, broken apart ones on the other side. Like, that's fun. Um, but I've, kind of, I've had to come to accept that I, I love this game. And but I love it despite the fact that it's not really a Fallout game, in that options to do different things aren't really there. There's really not a lot of skill checks in the game. You know, like in New Vegas, you had Edie, who you have like four different ways you could activate him. Like that stuff doesn't exist. The conversation system doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. You can't really be a bad guy in Fallout 4. You're just a good guy or kind of like a dick of a good guy, like in Mass Effect where you're like renegade. You're still a good guy, but you're kind of just like a dickish good guy. You're like, I'm um, solo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's no op guy. Like, it just, it, it really t strips away a lot of the options. But despite that, uh, if I look at it as, like, a, a fun, open-world, sandboxy shooter, uh, I, I, I really love it for, for that. Yeah. I, uh, I, get, I do want to mention, sorry, Nick, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I got so into the idea of the settlement thing, and I was running around, I was, like, cleaning up all the trees and cleaning up all the broken fences. I was like, this is going to be the greatest thing ever. I was so excited. And then I got to the part where I put down the first wall. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're kidding me, right? And I was like, chat, where do I hit, where's the grid button? I need this to snap. And they're, they're like, there isn't a grid. Yeah, like, good luck. I, the only reason I was so bothered is because I was so excited by it at the same time. Yeah. Like, if I didn't ever get that invested into the idea, I would have just been like, well, whatever, moving on. And that's eventually what I did. It's not like I'm dwelling on losing sleep over not gridding my house, but it matters. And I think it is a big part of the gameplay if you choose to accept it. And I did want to accept it and embrace mm -hmm. it, but I didn't have the option. Uh, but still, I got into some wild adventures anyway, so it's not like I'm not having fun. Yeah. Although I the bugs are cropping up more than ever now, and it's starting to Oh, I did. F I found a way to uh, get underneath the game, by the way. So that was, nice. that was a lot of fun. Oh, well, really? That's yeah, awesome. I just fell There's straight through. Adventures. I, I think I actually might have broken it for myself. I can't, I can't get into uh, Cambridge Police Station anymore. That's the door that breaks the game for me. So I go in there, oh, and then it sounds like every item in there is desperately shuffling around to try oh. to figure out how the fuck to put my character in the building and it can't do it so it just forces me yeah. down through every time and then the classical radio station is playing so as i'm just descending <laughs> into the abyss there's this nice piano ballad going on awesome it's very I, enjoyable i find that the bugs often give the game plenty of character and moments like you had are actually kind of like hilarious little experiences mm -hmm. i was running into stuff that was a little bit more insidious and obnoxious like the texture level of distance not loading in so i just run into these flat blurred textures yeah. or like flat things that were not actually there but they were walls mm -hmm. but you could walk through them so i had to like quit and reload the game a bunch i had my map stop appearing for a while or my fast travel wouldn't let me click on it the UI kept breaking. It's like, all right, no, I know Bethesda. I'm not surprised, but mm. like these things are a little bit encumbrances in me enjoying the game. So yeah, let's get those patches going. We'll be all right again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I did want to talk about uh, both Ryan and Math has kind of touched on this. Uh, the the dialogue options and just in general the ability to not really be an evil person. I know this is sort of a yeah. hot topic right now as far as Fallout 4 is concerned. So I do want to kind of weigh in on that. What do you guys? What are your what are your opinions in general on just your freedom of moral choice in the game. There, there isn't. There isn't, yeah. It feels super linear. Just like we're just along for the ride. Yeah, I, I, I wish there wasn't voice script. acting at all. I wish it was just the I way it was with, in 3. Yep, mm -hmm. I'm 100% I'm with Nick. I wish the main character didn't have a freaking voice. Just let me do what I fucking want, man. Like, you, you completely stripped away the freedom to tell your own story, and you're just telling us this one story, and I don't give a shit about, mm. <laughs> like, at all right now. <laughs> I feel like that's, uh, I agree, but I also feel like that's, so, I, I hesitate to say this because I, I feel like the more people love something, the more important the minor criticisms can become mm. if there's a change. Mm. Like, I agree that it's less of a sandbox, which is a little unfortunate, but I, it hasn't, like, killed very much enjoyment in the game for me. Like, you can still be kind of a dick, right? Like, you can't, yeah. you can't actually be like Darth Vader, but you can still be kind of an asshole. The, the thing that bothers me more than that is that the dialogue options don't have uh, the actual 
check Thanks registered to them, to them anymore. Yeah. Like the, the not even a percentage chance, but like what your speech stat would need to be because it no longer uses that. And I'm like, well, why do I even have? Like I just I remember in Fallout Three in New Vegas, man. If like you like all chat options now in Fallout Four, the the optional ones are all based on charisma. Period. Okay. But in other ones, mm. you used to have like if you had a high science stat, you could give like a scientific reply, or if you had a high intelligence, you could give an intelligent reply. If you were like uh, intimidating, you could give it like an intimidating reply. Like all that's gone. It is just charisma. Yellow is good. Orange is pretty bad. Red is good fucking luck. And that's the only <laughs> stats that are that you have. And that getting, I, I get it. And again, I I'm loving Fallout 4 despite that. Um, but I really miss that aspect of Fallout, and it doesn't feel like Fallout to me without those options. Instead, it feels like an open world, borderlandy kind of just exploration gun, ga- like a, a gun game. Yeah. So it's which is fun, but it's not Fallout. Mm-hmm. Can you help me remember when you said the the good funk and luck ones? Like w- those were percentages in three, right? So you yeah, got like, like a 10%, seven, ten percent, or yeah. something like that. You could still attempt them, though, right? Because in this, you yeah. mostly just can't even attempt them. If yeah. it's like a computer hacking thing, it's just like you can't do that. You don't have the skills to even try. Could you do yeah. that in three? Because I feel like you could. You could always attempt something if you had like yeah. the bare minimum requirements for it. New Vegas oh, was kind of okay. bullshit for that, though. Because you'd, be, you'd go to like a terminal. It would be like, oh, this is a hard one. But it's just like the word is longer that you have to yeah. hack. And then, like, the same thing for, for lockpicking was, like, you could do it, but the range in which it was actually successful was more narrow, yeah. which is kind of like it. But I, that's the kind of shit that I think people just gloss over because they're like, that's how Fallout works. But it, w- playing New Vegas for the first time in 2015, I was like, that's kind of a janky way to, like, artificially change the difficulty. But, so, I mean, maybe that's why, like, in, in 4, I'm a little bit more... Well, Fallout in changes, four, the but... hacking is the bigger, the the more difficult, the longer the word. Still, that's still. And that's why I, I I'm just using that as an example of oh, like, okay. like not everything maybe in New Vegas is something that I feel needs to be preserved throughout the franchise. I guess. I think Although for another is... another level of pedantry there too is the fact that basically no matter how long you make the word, that entire system is predicated upon the fact that you can solve every single one. Oh yeah. If you look at it the right way you know like it, there's, if you fail you can just back out before your final well try that too but also there's like a, a built-in formula that makes it so you can guess every single password if you consider every single variable you know it's like it, yeah. it literally can be solved every single time if you just pay attention so it, there's there's not really a way to make that more challenging i guess which means just overhaul the the mini game i guess yeah that yeah. would be kind of the only which way to I'm do it with mm-hmm I, like I just miss game. options. I think that's my only problem. My biggest gripe is I miss the options that Fallout gives you. Mm-hmm. Fallout used to be all about the myriad of different ways you could accomplish tasks, and that feels like it's gone. I yeah, I agree with you there. Like the, I I, I never really took an issue with the idea of there being a voice actor. I think there are certain times where I'm not really a fan of the way he reacts to certain things. He sort of plays an everyman a lot more often than I'd like him to, you know? He, 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 the voice he uses is sort of just meant to be a, a character that you can sink yourself into, but often I find myself looking at the ways he reacts to things as, you're just sort of being like, uh, you're, you're just doing what we would expect you to do, and there's not really any sort of flavor or variety to the interactions that the main character provides. You don't have the option, though, of role-playing as this character because you don't know what they're even going to say. So yeah, you're just that's kind of true, too. Exactly. Passively. Like, the, the dialogue options are so vague. And I think we touched on this last time as well. Yeah. It's just like there's, there's so many instances where you have absolutely no fucking idea what he's going to say. Especially if you choose the sarcastic option. That one's just completely out of left field. <laughs> but it's going to be sarcastic. You mm-hmm. know that much. I do agree that um, it, it feels less like an RPG and more like a shooter. Correct. But yeah. I guess where where I disagree is that I actually feel like I mean it's way too early for me to say that it's, I like it more or less than Fallout New Vegas. But the shooting is like it's really good. Oh, and I, I love feel like that. when you play like New Vegas, you you kind of just like it, it's like playing Diablo where you just sort of click to attack and that's it. Yeah. And I know if you really boil it down, like all shooters are click to attack. You just paint your mouse cursor over them, right? But it's a little bit needlessly redundant. Aren't, aren't all games just click to attack, Ryan? Exactly. <laughs> but it was more like click to attack and then like some dice rolls happen that determine how it goes. 
Fallout 4, you know, I, I think you, it's the first time you can actually be like, oh, the shooting is actually, like, really good and satisfying. Yeah. And then I'm like, man, I missed that through, like, the 80 hours of New Vegas or something that I played. So there's a little trade-off there. In, right now, I'm, I'm finding it enjoyable as a result. And I haven't really eaten the, the penalty for having few dialogue options, but I imagine that I probably will when I get to, like, a higher level. And in New Vegas, yeah. you're like, well, I used to have 11 things I could do here, now I have four. I also, I, I don't like that the persuasion dialogue options are always a percentage chance. And I believe that the higher your charisma stat uh, and the perks that you have, the more likely it is to be like a green persuasion check instead of a yellow or a red? I uh, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I've actually maxed out the charisma stat, and I still get quite a few of the red ones. So I, I feel maybe that's just sort of like, it just persistent maybe through the whole thing? I don't know. Maybe there's that, other elements that checks against. Maybe, yeah. But maybe if you had a lower charisma stat, you would have more yellows and reds. Maybe, maybe yeah. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, I don't know. But um, I, I, I dislike that because I feel like if you commit to putting like 10 in a special... That should you should be set for the game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I feel like, like in Fallout New Vegas, when your speech hit like ninety, you could just do whatever you wanted with it, and I feel like right. that's that's something you should be able to I do. Mean, and at, with charisma at like eight, I'm still like, um, you know, I, I hey, can you give me like twenty five extra caps for this? And then they're like, nah, sorry, like we rolled the dice and we decided yeah. you can't, but. And I agree with you that, like, change is good, and I really like the gunplay change, and I love that. Because if you're going to put somebody in first to third person and with, with a gun, you want the controls to feel like a shooter. That makes sense, and I agree that in Fallout 3 in New Vegas, the shooting was janky at best, and you used VATS as often as you could. I just wish it didn't come at the expense of options as to what to do in the game, because, again, I feel like it is just an open-world shooter where you're looking for loot, and the story kind of plays second fiddle to the mechanics of the game. Um, and again, I, I, not having the options to do what you want really, it kills me. It kills me as an RPG and a Fallout lover. Somebody who's played all of the Fallouts multiple times, I miss just having options. Simple well, as that. There's options in different ways, though. And I think the meat and potatoes for the game for me is the exploration, the loot, and the like inventory management stuff, which I know a lot of people find annoying. But I'm like a Borderlands Diablo guy. I love that stuff. So I spent a lot of time wandering. I, like, I didn't follow the quest lines at all. I just kind of walked across from the, the west to the east coast. And then I got a perk somewhere along the line that let me swim with no breath meter. So I just started swimming along the coast down south. And I had a lot of fun just like randomly seeing what I'd run into. Eventually, I found a freaking fat man over there, which was awesome. Because nice. now I've got a super freaking awesome gun yeah. that I didn't expect to run into. Because I decided to go to like the hardest area in the game for no reason, even though it was like level 5. And... Yeah. Uh, I, I love doing that kind of shit where there's like actually crazy areas you're not supposed to be in and I find myself there and I try to exploit it a little bit. It's mm. sort of sequence breaking and that's I'll double down on that too actually. Yeah, I really like that still. There is that that freedom has been preserved at least while there not be, be as much freedom in the realm of dialogue and narrative. I think the idea of being able to just go around and do whatever the fuck you want is still very much alive in the yeah. game. And that's, I think, the strongest element of Fallout for me. I mean, those complaints I had about the dialogue, sure, they come up pretty frequently because you do have to push the story along eventually. But if you're after what I'm after, like, you'll still have a great time, and I am. I'm not really upset with the game, ultimately. Hmm. No, I, yeah, I think it's like Ryan said, you know, like the, the more we glorify something, the more analytical we become about every single yeah. little nitpicky detail. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, so. We're breaking it down so we have something to talk about is what it is. I don't think any of us are <laughs> really Besides just gushing it. for it for another uh, yeah. uh, half hour or so. But uh, no, I, I think it's, I think it's valid to, uh, to say that maybe just the entire formula for how Bethesda approaches your, you know, like the finality of decisions and also, you know, like your, your ability to actually impact things in a meaningful way as far as your interactions with people and the way that you choose to progress the story is, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's not always been this way, but it, it certainly seems like they're uh, going a lot more in the route of sort of linear stuff which mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily work as well with these games, at least in our opinion. Uh, you know, it's like Isaac when they do something like nerf Krampus's head, make it like a six-room charge instead of a three-room charge. <laughs> People who are really into Isaac are like, this is irredeemable. And everybody else that's like a little bit more casually into the game is like, I, I didn't even notice a change at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I think that's kind of like Mathis and myself is that Mathis is so into it that he can like, 
care about the minutia, and I'm just kind of like it misses me because I'm not. I haven't been submerged in the in the universe long enough to to care. Yeah. Uh, and I'm uh, I may be even just like right between you guys where I, I I do enjoy the series. I don't think I've really invested myself too heavily into it. Like I, I, I for example, I'm not the kind of person who would argue for the existence of cats in the game like Mathis would based on lore <laughs> and not, not anything else. But he was uh, arguing for the non-existence of cats, wasn't he? Yeah, no, that's what I was saying. Is like I, yeah, yeah. that I, I definitely am not close to that realm of knowledge of the game. But I do, you know, like I enjoy it, and I think, right, right. just in general, my experience has been very uh, solid and positive. You know, like I, I've been uh, boasting about the game on Twitter quite a bit too. So it's been, it's still been just extremely good. But you know, we do like to. I mean, uh, yeah, I have thirty hours into it so far. I love it. There's yeah. no doubt. I love it. I, I have my complaints. So. Mm-hmm. Uh. Well, let's let's get into Isaac. Now that we mentioned that, uh, if you guys have not been following the madness, the Binding of Isaac Afterbirth community has been participating in an alternate reality game with the developers, with uh, Edmund and Tyrone in particular, who set about to make sure that what happened with the Lost did not happen again with Afterbirth. Can I? It got uh, complicated. It did. Yeah, <laughs> Nick, Nick, give me like a, give me like the brass tacks rundown, yeah. and then give me. We'll get into like we're gonna break this down so you guys can see just how totally insane this was. So the first element that I'm I became aware of was the constant use of this number one hundred nine that was just being thrown around with no real context. Well, the game was still fairly new. Everyone was sort of testing the limits of what really was at the base level of this expansion pack. You know, are there going to be many secret characters? Are there going to be all these items that are not on the list? I remembered hearing that uh, Edmund and Tyrone had said there's going to be this many new items, and then I looked at the list and like, there aren't that many new items. Something's wrong here. Mm -hmm. Eventually it came to light that there was something amiss in, I don't know if it was bugs or testing or something that just didn't come out right. Eventually they patched in a set of new items. Now along the same time with this, this was maybe, what, a week and a half, two weeks after launch, Uh, Along with this, they started doling out this generosity achievement to certain people, and it it used to look like one thing, and then it looked like another thing after the patch. Now, after the patch, it started to look a little bit like dots and dashes, which, as it turned out to be, it was. Uh, So someone decoded this, turned it into a series of numbers, which then correlated with a word called, uh, it said, larabeal, and then we eventually figured out this is an immigrant link. Following that immigrant link led to a picture of the lost with a bunch of shadows and a quote that said, uh, and he removed that day that he goats, I think is what that says. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. It's a very interesting quote. Really odd thing. Now, if you're following along with this, all of these things seem very out of context and sort of meaningless until you realize that actually part of the ARG is to follow Tyrone and Edmund's personal Twitter accounts. Uh, Edmund had posted a picture of a spider that he'd found in his garage and the spider was not at all the focus of that picture in the background. There was an image or a movie poster from the movie The Lost Boys. Uh, that was actually a correlation to that last image with the picture of the lost and those shadows behind it. You're supposed to put these two things together. Uh, there was then a tweet or several tweets. Uh, one of them eventually had a quote, uh, People are strange, which is the song that was played in the introduction of The Lost Boys. So there's many points to reiterate and bring people back to this element of this movie has something to do with this game. I want to slow you down for a second here, too, because I just yeah. want to like I point out the absurdity a little bit just from we are not even we're breaching the surface level of this ARG right now. And think about already the steps that have been required. We're, we're, decoding, we're decoding hidden Morse code in order to lead to a code that ends up being an Imgur link that turns out to lead to an image with the lost, with a a random Bible quote, it seems, followed by an indication that we have to look into their personal Twitter accounts for potential clues. And when you see it all, like, mapped out like this, you don't appreciate how insane that is to come to that conclusion. And that's not even the craziest parts yet. Yeah, no, we're, we're not even <laughs> close. <laughs> so, okay, Mathis, I want, you to, I want you to pick up where you left off here. I don't know any of the shit that we I know, down. but you're that, we're, gonna, we're all Just learning together. No. <laughs> 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 it's it's about the same thing. I, I don't so, know. What no, do you well, want okay, me to so say? We're, we're in the Lost Boys part, right? So you're following along with the ha- image I, here. I, have, I do not have Okay, you got, you got to pull that up, man. You got to be on I board didn't with know. this. Keep going. I wasn't paying attention. So, people are strange is the song playing 
in the introduction scene of The Lost Boys, the, the poster in the background does not even have the words The Lost Boys on it. It's just, it's just a poster but for the movie. A fairly recognizable image if you were around to see that movie being promoted, I suppose. Yeah. Although I think a lot of people wouldn't have made that correlation. Right. So in the introduction to The Lost Boys, the film... The movie's characters, I'm just reading straight from the image here. The movie's characters are on the Santa Cruz boardwalk. They're showing, there are many shots showing dozens of wanted posters. So they made that correlation. They made, a, they made a tie between the introduction to the film The Lost Boys and then made a reference to that within uh, the most recent ending, which was added into Afterbirth, showing a missing poster for... Um, Isaac, I believe. I thought there was also a timestamp in one of the tweets as well that pointed to a specific shot in the intro of that movie. Like, if you knew what the time was and applied it to the movie, you would see the pictures of the wanted posters. Oh my god, that would be... I don't see that on this list, but I remember that point coming up during the discussion of this. So I was kind of oh, actively do you know following what? Yeah. this along. I think uh, right here you might be pointing this out. More specifically, near a train bridge at the 3035 mark in The Lost Boys... A yeah, character says, perfect timing, and then it cuts to a scene at a, tr at a train bridge. Yeah. So they, went, uh, so they went on the hunt for clues near People the Santa Cruz boardwalk. The world now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're, they're looking now that, uh, well, Edmund had started to imply that the things they were looking for were, you know, like physical items outside of the game and in the real world. Yes. Uh, <laughs> he's just res rescinding into the hoodie. That is good. Uh, character says perfect timing. It cuts to a scene at a train bridge. Uh, Reddit user goes out and looks for clues in Santa Cruz. He finds a, a an actual missing poster for uh, the Binding of Isaac that is out on the Santa Cruz Boulevard or boardwalk, I think. And man, it just keeps going. We're not even halfway through. I've noticed. Oh, God. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm going to go pee. I'll be right back. Oh. I'm going to get some coffee. <laughs> All Holy right, everyone's shit. leaving. Yeah, I, I guess this so. was pretty interesting. No, it cool. certainly is. Uh, so there was a phone number on the bottom. Part of it was missing. Mm -hmm. And they needed to put together the way to figure out the last four digits, which is apparently a reference to John 424, which was a hint to the area code of the phone number. I'm not really sure I followed how they came up with those last digits here. No, me neither. Uh, yeah, it's... Last four digits were found by logic based on the fact that it took data miners 109 hours to discover the loss. That's very vague. Yeah. So something to do with the lost's origination led to them being able to figure out the last four numbers. But this is where it got really cool because now they have a phone number to call. And yes. they start calling and there's this backmasked phrase. Uh, it says, hello, and then backward word, I'm your backward word. Uh, I know what you came for, but I need to hear you ask me. So you had to figure out that the backward words by recording the message and playing it to yourself. Uh, the backwards words were Isaac and father. So hello, Isaac, I am your father. I know what you came for, I need to hear, uh, hear you ask me. So then the next thing became, how do we figure out what to leave as a message on this voicemail to get to the next stage of this? Oh my god. And they have the voicemail up, by the way. There's the link. I think they still have that available if you want to listen to it. It is uh, the narration is done by the uh, the same narrator for the intro to the game. So it's actually kind of cool that they got him to do this as well. Uh, the the voicemail, you know, they they figured that out for a while. They answered to the question, "Where are you?" Uh, which was, I guess, hinted by it was in the it's in the item log. Yeah. So if you're collecting all the items and you have a series of them next to each other, there was a bunch of hidden messages overlaid on top of them, which they then subsequently patched out after the uh, message was taken. Wow. So there So uh, yeah, hours later the voicemail yeah. changed and then after they'd given them the proper message, it speaks Christ calls generous gods don't guide history forever. Backwards words, we need to go deeper. Knowledge and then the backwards grows. Words, yes. Knowledge grows. Ugh his final form ends beyond greed. So at that point, you're starting to get implications about the game. But remember, very little of this had to do with the actual game and playing it. Yeah. There were just sort of meta levels about the game that were happening, like that message in the UI. So uh, some time passed. Eventually, there was another tweet. Uh, we almost revealed more evil, right? Is what Edmund tweeted. And you were supposed to look at the first letter of each one of those words to spell yeah. former. Uh. I think I think a lot of it sort of just became you know silly for the sake of being silly about it you know like there's there's parts where you're just introducing 
obstacles that really add nothing to it like recording backwards words again is just for fun and then Edmund was just be goofing with these guys at well, this point after a while though they had tweeted a bunch of random letters to Edmund that they had decoded from something else mm -hmm. and then Edmund realized that was the correct message to advance things again and uh, what we figured out was eventually there was a a series of coordinates which for GPS, like lat lawn coordinates, mm. which led to a building in Santa Ana, which happened to have the address 109. I think Brian's just dead. <laughs> I can't believe this is still happening. It's, it's still going, it's like, man. Oh, we're almost done. So we're almost and, there, and yeah. He ate uh, Fruity Pebbles for breakfast, and he used 2% milk instead of skim milk, and there's, there's meaning inherent in the in the, in the Look, subtext. they made it up to be a fun little game. My name's Norton Lion, and I think when people have fun, it sucks. No, the ARG was really <laughs> cool just... Going over every single step is exhausting, it's, man. To emphasize I, I, how ridiculous Yeah, it exactly. Was. We're 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 giving credence to the the degree of difficulty that this took. I I want to I want to appreciate the so level. So I can cover the last depth. bits here quickly. Yeah. The coordinates led to a building having a photography. There was a an area on the ground with some change on it. People went there and found it. They dug up a little greed statue which had numbers and, and an at sign on its head, apparently, although mm. it doesn't look like an at sign. They put together that Greed apparently had a Twitter account, and then they had to hack into that Twitter account to make it say things, and then after they made it say the right thing, the community unlocks a new character for the game, mm. and that's the end of the ARG. Maybe. I w <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, so maybe we didn't need to break the whole thing down, but... I I do like that we did because goddamn it's ridiculous. So this unlocks a new character in the game called the Keeper, and the Keeper, a lot of people have said, is really not that fun to play. Unfortunately, right? Oh, no. It's, yeah. I haven't so, talked to anyone who's played him really. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's another very difficult character. So he starts God, with uh, <laughs> he starts with two coins for hearts and. The, you can lose those, you can regain those back just by picking up coins. I believe red hearts drop as blue flies, and uh, then there's a couple of other differences in the game. He is a very different character, so at least there's that. You know, like it's a very different way to play the game, much in the same way that greed mode which was a much different way to play the game in right. general. Uh, but, you know, I think the reward was cer certainly fitting. It's a very different uh, piece of the rebirth puzzle, and... It was just, man, that was just wild. So I'm glad there's, there was more to it. I didn't want it to end up not being a character. Sorry. Yeah, please no, don't take my uh, resident sleeping as me not being down with the ARG, because I stayed up to watch it resolve, and I was like, this is really cool, and every time there was like a new piece of the treasure hunt they got uncovered, I was like, whoa, that's I can't believe Edmund and Tyrone went to this much trouble. Yeah. And I also love that um, one of the guys who went to the like Santa Ana building and found the mini greed statue was like, yeah, there was also like a van, uh, and we saw a dude oh, in it. God. So we all sprinted over to it, and then when we when we sprinted, it just turned its lights on and sped away as quickly as it could. And I was like, fucking the idea of Tyrone, right, being like in his <laughs> van, just like taking pictures, and then they start sprinting, and he's like, oh shit, gotta like that is really actually hilarious to yeah. me. Um, I hope it wasn't I'm, just I'm, some random guy that saw like a group of four or five teenagers just start sprinting yeah. at his car. <laughs> so I, I actually really like the the uh, the ARG, and I know that there is there's a subset of people who are like, well, you know, I don't really like the ARG, and I wish they hadn't gated content. That's fine, but at the same time, I I think that in a year people are going to remember the ARG more fondly and they're not going to give a shit that it took a couple of extra weeks in order to unlock yeah. it. And, mm. uh, you know, admittedly, I'm kind of biased towards Isaac and the and the creators because they basically helped me pay my bills. But uh, it's like, you know, they, they did something unique and special with it instead of um, just kind of floating it out there. If they just gated the content and then been like, you know, oh, here it is. Mm -hmm. fuck, fuck you for data mining the lost last year. Yeah. Then that would have been one thing. That would have that would have come across in poor taste, I think. But to to have like a cool kind of like outside of the game treasure hunt to go along with it, uh, I think more than makes up for it. Agreed. I mean, I, I actually personally would have preferred that it was all inclusive in the game somehow. That you could have actually done like a grander version of what they did with the lost. Only I understand why they did it this way. The data mining was going to happen no matter what they did. So it was kind of the only way to proceed. 
But, you know, all things being the same, if there was a way that we could have collectively figured things out as a community within the game, and, like, we had to dig this certain spot on Hush, and then that would lead to this new floor, like, that would have been really exciting. Yeah. And we could have all been having hands-on experience with it at the same time, whereas we can't all go to Santa Ana, California and dig a hole, right? So that kind of feels like it's just for a certain group of people that are able to do that. But still, it was cool to follow along and watch as it evolved on Twitter and all that. Mm. I agree. It was fun. It was, yeah, it was just... I, I, I wasn't expecting that. That's that's for damn sure. That that totally caught me off guard to see that that all wow. did play out that way. Like When I initially saw everyone reacting so negatively toward Edmund and the team, you know, for yeah, supposedly being a very... Uh, you know counter community it seemed uh that was i i didn't at all expect that that would lead into oh there's this tremendous alternate reality game that they've developed for you to play and the i mean well obviously the community did a pretty quick 180 as soon as that all start, started to come into play and now they are all back on board for the most part i think uh but that was man that was a crazy turn of events i don't think they were ready to to see everyone kind of just turn on a dime like that, you know? Yeah. It was like as soon as the the vile behavior was detected, is instantly, it was like, Edmund is the worst human being of all fucking time, you know? And yeah, that was... But now it's which okay. is true. I'm, but, <laughs> yeah. I'm glad 109 wasn't a troll. Like, that whole yeah. thing wasn't just like, we're just going to make fun of the situation. Instead, they actually turned it into something pretty cool. So mm -hmm. if it ended up leading nowhere, I think there would have been a lot more frustration. Definitely. Guys, I can't I wait have to play another shit character. Exclusive news. <laughs> what's, what's that? Yeah. Political, 20, uh, Political Machine 2016, now available on Early Access. I'm so ready. Oh. Oh, man. Can we can we hurry can this I, up a little bit? Can I can I be Bernie? <laughs> yes. Feel the burn. You could you could either you could be any of the presidential candidates, even the fringe ones, or you can make your own candidate. Like you can make literally Satan. Mm hmm. That's the, a callback, I think. Yeah. That's Satan running for president. Josh or Melf, one of them played that. Josh is Satan. Yeah, that's so all. There was like you can make you can make literally Satan and then just name them like not Satan. Oh and okay, then, yeah, you know. <laughs> So EA's Battlefront review event was kind of an ordeal. Uh, a lot of major outlets refused to go. What which... is a review event, Bear, so, for people who don't know? A review event, an industry review event, is uh, something that's sort of spawned pretty recently. I think with, like within the last few years, there have been quite a few more of them. Uh, it's an event where a lot of the big publications are invited out. So say you've got like your IGN, Kotaku, Destructoid, Polygon, all those people are invited to attend an event that is in a very controlled environment that is kind of designed to provide the reviewers with the most ideal experience possible for the game. So, you know, clearly right. it's in the publisher and developer's best interest to provide these major outlets with this scenario in order to review their game properly. And, you know, on the flip side, that's clearly not really in the best interest of those publications if, you know, uh, they want to bring the integrity of it into the conversation to, you know, sort of subject themselves to those conditions. So a lot of people now, uh, ad admirably so, have been refusing to attend these events. And for those very reasons, it seems, they, they recognize that these review events are very much catered toward making the experience as enjoyable and as uh, positive as they can. And, you know, that's it's called bias. Yeah, very disingenuous, you know. So uh, the, the most recent example of this is EA hosting a Star Wars Battlefront review event in uh, Redwood Shores, California. And uh, most places did not go. And Ryan, I know you were uh, reading up about this a lot, too, pretty recently. Yeah, you know, review events are something that uh, uh, publications have kind of been pushing back against, which I think is a good thing because it, it typically ends up being um, either a huge game that they want to, like, stop spoilers for, which I feel like in the internet age is just, like, it's kind of needlessly protective. Yeah, don't even bother. Regardless. Yeah, mm -hmm. like Smash Bros. You know, right? <laughs> yeah, Fallout Four spoilers came out. You know, like a week before the game actually released, and you know they're they're just gonna be out there. It's it's one of those things that's gonna happen. Or it's for um, multiplayer games, and then it seems dishonest to judge it based on a review event because it's ideal conditions and 
you know, you don't know if the servers are actually going to work on day one. And then as we saw yesterday, like the battlefront servers just weren't working for a lot of people. So um, I'm, I think it's really positive that uh, a lot of publications are choosing to ignore review events. Uh, it makes me wonder if there's going to be pushback against like preview events soon because, you know, we've, we've attended those in the past. And it's a little different, like, it, it, it's kind of up to the person's discretion how much they want to be like, well, you can go pre-order it now at, like, this link in the video description below. But mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder if maybe that's the next thing. Because I think we all agree that, like, I guess it's, like, nice to be flown to San Francisco and then, like, play a game with your colleagues. But mm -hmm. it would also be, like, really dope for the publisher to not do that and instead... Yeah just give you like a time limited steam key and then be right. like hey they can it's happened before there yeah. are publishers that have done that and yeah. yeah and then you know but you know the the publishers they they want to keep uh, as much as possible within their control so they can kind of control the message that comes out and that's why whenever there's a game preview very rarely is it like well, it kind of seems shitty yeah you know <laughs> it's yeah. like it, it's su it's in such ideal circumstances and the event has been kind of like curated so hard that you're just like, well, you know, it's okay. But we'll see what happens when release comes around. But uh, yeah, I, I would prefer to just get sent the games in the mm. email and then not have to go to the airport at 6 a.m. And then, you know, fly <laughs> back at 8 p.m. that night. Well, yep, you, you, I mean, let's let's be real. That's, that's sort of a, a plan that you might be better off going on an overnight trip. But... But then it's like, I'd, I'd, I'd rather not have to disclose taking a hotel room. Also, oh, yeah. like, it, they're usually in, like, San Francisco. Like, if I did it, I would disclose it, but I just mm -hmm. prefer to limit it as much as possible. Plus, I live close enough where I'm, like, it's only, like, a two-hour flight. If I can get, like, a same-day flight, I'd prefer to, but... Yeah. Get home, not have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, like, wait, wake up in your own bed after, like, four hours of sleep rather than wake up in San Francisco after six hours of sleep, take a two-hour flight, get home at, like, noon, and then your day's kind of half-shot. Yeah. Uh, no, so, yeah, I mean, obviously, they, they do these things for a reason, you know? Like, when, when I'm going out to Ubisoft events in San Francisco, for example, they, they make a point of it to give you a good welcome like they they take care of us they don't they, they don't like put, put us in goddamn lazy boys and massage our feet or anything <laughs> yeah. like that i'm saying like you know they 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 That'd put an effort excellent though. yeah oh god i wish they put an effort into you know making it a very positive environment the people there are they're pr people they they know that the entire point of the youtubers being there is to you know get them excited about the game and get them feeling good and positive about it so they can share that with their audiences and that I, I doubt that unless there is a uh, backlash against it, as you mentioned, that they'll ever stop doing that in favor of something like, you know, giving out the preview code. I, I, I don't know if there will be a similar backlash against the preview events either. I think there's maybe enough of a, um, I don't know, I like guess just, it, it's not so set in stone when you're discussing a preview event. I think a preview has enough of a uh, leeway to it that you can sort of just present that as information and then add the caveat of obviously this is all subject to change and does not necessarily reflect the final build. And then you've got a cop out for when the game ends up being shit uh, three mm -hmm. months down the road. So, you know, the preview events I still think are... I don't I don't even necessarily have an issue with preview events either. I think, I think they sort of just provide an opportunity for uh well i think in in particular let's just like refer to it in the sense of for us so like yeah. for for events that people like us attend i think this is good that in that it establishes these connections that didn't really exist a few years ago the the developers that are now inviting youtubers and twitch streamers out to play their games uh such as ubisoft and now ea with ronku that obviously they're getting a lot more involved or uh, how do you even say that is it Ronku? Wrong. I think it's That's Ronku, how I yeah. say it, yeah. But uh, yeah, they're clearly getting a lot more involved on that end, and I, th I think that's overall going to be a positive for uh, the folks that like to rely on uh, you YouTubers and Twitch streamers to get a good idea of whether or not they want to buy a game. I think that's a good thing still. What's nice about the YouTube stuff is that it does lead to footage, I guess. Yeah. Instead of just writing. Mm -hmm. Not that one is necessarily better than the other, but one is probably more representative, so... 
Definitely. I feel like we're just thankful that they're validating us as existing, which is not really a good enough reason. <laughs> Thank no, you that's for that is where I have <laughs> a I have a problem with it. Is that yeah. I feel like for like a year I was like these people know I exist, and then now I'm kind of like. Just send me the game. <laughs> right, have like, footage. It's just all about that they don't trust yeah. anybody, right? So if they just sent you the, the copy, then you could get your footage just fine. Mm -hmm. It's so yeah. they can massage everything and make it come out the way they want. And I think that's just not the right way to go about it if you want honest representation. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree with that. And that's why, like, review events, I think, are a super no-no. Because reviews are kind of like, for better or for worse, they're the be-all, end-all in our the critical part of the games industry. Reviews mm -hmm. are, like, what people get riled up over regardless yeah. of the score. Previews are just kind of content, you know? Right. Like, previews just exist, and if you're excited for a game, you read it. It's not like it actually has any critical heft to it. But I, I agree with Nick, and sometimes, not to throw, like, names out there, but I'll, like, go to an event like this, and people are just, like, happy to be there, and I'm like, that's not really what... That's why they want you here, mm -hmm. but yeah. you should, that's you not have, why you should want to be and there. And that was that was absolutely me for like the first three times, man. I was just a, to a yeah. degree, it had to have been like all of us for a little <laughs> bit. Oh my god, hold on, Ryan. We have the best fucking yeah, freeze frame really of your good. face right now. This is the this is the greatest moment of my oh, life. Yeah. <laughs> hey, this is uh, Northern Lion calling in from the Dominican Republic right now. <laughs> I I would like that to Bear. You're frozen now too for me. No, I'm no, just wait. fucking with you. <laughs> <laughs> You're still frozen. Yeah, I don't know if that's ever going to change. Oh my god. that I, I mean, we've only got an hour of the show left. Maybe we should just get, <laughs> just roll with that. This is beautiful. Oh my that's got to be a new emote for you. Yeah, line yeah. Hey! Oh, man. <laughs> this is just the most wonderful organic moment. It's just gonna like keep it there, huh? Yeah, that's just gonna be the thing. Okay, that's that's Ryan's that's face for the re for the remainder of the well, show. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm kind of like you know, it's it's just in I can't focus on myself looking like that, but uh, I, I'm kind of like you know, like I would much rather. I don't know. It's not a trip, and that's the thing. People are always like, yeah. When when you disclose things, I find that people are usually great about it, and they're usually like, "Thanks for the disclosure. Hmm. I can make my own decisions on it." But then there are people who are like, you know, you go to like some northern Californian city that is not San Francisco. People hmm. are like, "Hope you enjoyed your free vacation." And I'm like, "Man, I'm like sequestered in this like suburban hotel room, hmm. like next to a gas station, and just like eating flaming hot Cheetos for sustenance." <laughs> like, I, I would much rather not have to fly. <laughs> yes, the flight is free. Oh, God. Um, or paid for by them. And just be in my underwear at home and then be playing this. And I'm like, but I don't know if we're, if we're quite there, but we're sort of we're sort of getting there. There are some people, some developers, usually not publishers, but there are some that are like, all right, we'll just send you, like, a, a copy of the game that expires in, like, four days and just get your content done by then, which is much better. You can even do a contract. There's so many ways to go about this that there's no reason it has to be this way. They just prefer it to be this way. Yeah. No, yeah, exactly. Like, it's very much by design. This is a very deliberate thing, as I mentioned. They don't want to give this up. This is a good relationship that they have now. And it took a little while, as you mentioned, for them to really... Oh, God. Okay, let's... Uh... <laughs> no, he's coming back. Get I think that's way. coming back. I'm, I'm terrified about, like, a Skype name showing up on the screen or something. Oh, uh, I see. Okay, no, we're good. Okay, we I got it. we're fine. Nice. Fine. Well done. Uh, yeah, it's, it is a thing that they want to hold on to. And, and as we mentioned, it took a little while for them to sort of embrace uh, the YouTuber and Twitch streamer as uh, someone they want to be friendly with. But now that they've done it, it yeah, I, I, I definitely see the cynicism. And I think it's warranted oh. because the, there's not a lot of reason for us to you know, think that we should be buddy-buddy because we don't really have any sort of uh, precedent for that, but... I just, there's a reason that I think it smacks so hard to me of being a little bit disingenuous, and it's because I'm coming from GameStop, where a lot of the time, if you ever felt like you had leverage as an employee there, they'd go, well, it's really cool that you get to work and talk about games, right? Yeah, so you'll just nah, do that yeah, thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So, like, it would be a shame if you couldn't do that anymore. You might have to work at McDonald's or something. Mm -hmm. And, like, <laughs> that's, like, a really shitty bit of leverage that people have over you. And I'm not saying that they're necessarily comparable, but I do feel a little bit of that same kind of pushback that's like, well, you have to acknowledge it's pretty cool that we think you're a cool YouTuber, right? And there's about a million others of you. So, yeah. like, be a shame if we didn't support you, right? I... That's, 
I really had cynical, that, I know. No, yeah, and I had that fear, man. I really did. Like back in, I'm, I'm gonna just fucking blow open the doors on this whole thing, apparently. Whoa. But uh, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no, ready. Don't Bring expose me. I'm not about to drop a bombshell or anything. I'm just saying, no, like, no. this is my experience with it. So when I when I first got contacted by Ubisoft to go out and play a game, I believe it was, uh, it must have, it was the new Far Cry. Yeah, it must have been Far Cry Four, and that blew my fucking mind. That that right there was. I'm 15 years old and this is the best day of my life because, right, right, uh, right. you know, it's, it's Ubisoft telling me, hey, we want to fly you out to play our game on our dime. Yeah. And I was just like, are you, are you sure? <laughs> Do you know who you're talking to? Are you sure? <laughs> and yeah, I mean, that was a great experience. And I, I went out there, I met with all the Ubisoft people. I played the game. It was a lot of fun. It was a very positive and enjoyable experience environment very much by design so now that game actually came out good too yeah it was. Four is a good game it was it's excellent good. yeah very good um but you know now i've got a few of them a few of them under my belt so i've been to a couple of assassin's creed events now i've been to a uh and it's, or no, it was a uh, god damn, they've had so much shit recently. <laughs> Man, it's been, they've been putting out a lot of games. But, you know, I've been to a few of their events now, and I've sort of got a, a footing established there. And now I am getting to the point where I'm starting to think about it in terms of A, do I even want to go? And B, what is this relationship? So I've had to think about that, right? I've had I've had to decide whether or not I'm really just sort of like a, a monkey dancing for Ubisoft when I'm doing these things. And I like to believe that the approach I've taken to it has been fairly um, free of bias, you know? Like I, I've, I've put forward the effort into uh, covering the game, and I've, I've given my honest opinion about it every single time I've gone. And that is not an issue with them. As far as I can tell, there have been times where I've suspected that maybe I'm not getting as many uh, assists as I could be from them, just based on the fact that you know I haven't really been their uh, their show pony for a couple yes. of the games that they've had. But <laughs> it, you know, at the same time, I I still have a very good relationship, a working relationship with those people, and it hasn't really been based on me just saying what they want me to say. So I'll vouch for that. I think there's, I think there's a good relationship to be had that that isn't that isn't necessarily just a, a YouTuber just you know spewing bullshit about a game for the sake of being able to fly out yeah. and play it for free. I, I really don't think that's a prevalent issue. Is what I want to say. I, I I doubt it. Well, the one the line that I see is that there's no we don't sign like an ethics agreement as YouTubers, right? So anybody yeah. that feels like they want to become the shill for whatever company is free to be that. Yeah. And yeah. they're obviously going to select whoever is the most favorable for them. So like mm. they're always going to be in that position where they're looking for those people that'll emerge and then they go after them. And that's how these connections happen and they're always going to be propagating each other. It's uh it's I mean, an you're right. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. I mean, no, I mean, I feel like I was the same way for like my first trip, and I've had the weird experience where it was like my first trip, and then the trip I started being like eh for all happened very soon. It was like lots of trips all <laughs> back to back, <laughs> um, and it's it's really it's one of those things you're like, oh, this is excellent, this is so cool. But by like the fifth one, I was like, I don't. I don't want to fly. Yeah, yeah. I just send me the goddamn <laughs> game. I don't want to. Oh god. Okay, wait. You're flying me on a huge trip. Over the ocean, I have to fly back a day after. Mm -hmm. So I have to yeah. eight hours on a plane there, eight hours on a day on a plane back in two days. It's like, I could just play, like, just give me the fucking code. I can get a group of people together and we can all play mm -hmm. this multiplayer focused game and just for a couple days and have our own opinion on it. It is, it's really exciting right away because, like you said, it's very much like they, they realize what yeah. they recognize mm -hmm. me. I'm, like, I'm a rock I'm star. I'm real. Oh, uh, yeah. Woo. <laughs> going, I'm a rock star. And then after that, you're like, well, unless I turn this into a vacation. Like by paying an extra like grand to yeah. stay there an extra five days in an expensive city or whatever, then it's not really worth it for me to go. Yeah, I just want to stay home. And that happens very very quickly, I think, for almost everybody uh, who does these types of things. I do want so. to dispel the rumor too that this is just like a miniature vacation that we get to. Take. Oh, it's it, not. It, it's any other business trip you can think of. You know, it's like you're not. Unless going you there think to a mini vacation time. is set, spending. 10 hours in a room with sweaty people <laughs> playing a game and having a half hour lunch break in between because that's what it is. Hey, I mean, even when you put it that way, it's not really the worst thing in the world. But also, you know, it's, you it's, home. it's work. Yes, it's work. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, if if this is our job, if doing our job at home is not a vacation, then 
going to these events is not a vacation. Mm-hmm. Especially like what what was uh, evident for me when I first got started was like I would take like any trip yeah. if they were yeah. like we want to send you to like this doesn't exist but like we want to send you to Cleveland to look at like I don't know Baku I'd, Baku Five. Sure, yeah, exactly. I'd be like, yeah, why not, right? And then I would get there, and I'd, it would be like a half day of traveling, and I'd be like, I don't even like this game. Like, what if I'd mm. play it and be like, this sucks. I don't, <laughs> I don't even want to be here. So now, like, I've become a lot more selective about what I, like, will and won't travel for, especially overseas is, like, That's it, it, again, it is flattering. You're like, you're going to spend that much money on yeah. me to go check out your game? But then I'm like, I don't really want to do that. Like, I, I had... Way back, even like three years ago or two years ago, I had a uh, an offer to like go to the UK, and I was like, "That's pretty cool." The game looked like shit, and yeah. then I <laughs> I, uh, I like saw tweets from the event, and I was like, "I see you, motherfuckers. You know, you knew that looked like shit when you accepted that <laughs> offer." But. So what's the? Uh... <laughs> Have you gone to, would you say you've gone to like a proper review event or what would you say is no, the closest never, you've been no. to that? No, like, um, I, I, don't, I don't think I've even come close to a review event. Mm. The only thing that they do with, with YouTubers that I've seen is preview events, basically. Yeah. Or like, yeah, or like um, promotional events. I know that they'll do that with a lot of YouTubers. Mm. Like, come yeah. to this office and stream this game on launch day. Well, yeah, and those, thing. I mean, those are obviously promotional. So, you but know, no, like, no, they make I'm it very saying, clear. Like, as far that, as YouTuber yeah. stuff is concerned, mm-hmm. I've only seen like that and like preview events. I don't think I've ever heard of a YouTuber going to like a, a review event? Mm. Fuck, dude. How good would it be if there was like a promo Let's Play event where they're like, hey, come to our office for like two days. Just record the whole game yeah. in our office yeah. and then upload it. <laughs> or you can just send me be, the fucking game. <laughs> that would be hilarious. It's like, yo, we're going to give you exclusive access, but you got to come out to San Francisco Whoa. and play the game in our office and record it there. And you got to let us watch you. We're going to have the three lead developers on the team standing behind you the entire time. You don't time. think that that's happened? That has to have happened no, somewhere. I don't think that's happened. Well, no, I'll tell yet. you what. Like the There's a few people that will go to the Ubisoft events, and like Ubisoft is pretty cool about allowing them to capture a good amount of footage mm-hmm. but they'll they're straight up recording the let's play videos yeah. in the room with everyone else around them they're being like yeah. obnoxiously loud and i'm like man fucking I'm- come on like at least do a post <laughs> vo of that shit and don't ruin yeah. everyone else's experience with it yeah but- I've been there too. We'll, yeah. we'll talk after. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you're just like playing the game, and then there's people like across from you cracking mm. jokes. And I'm like, it, it takes like a certain amount of bravado to do that too, which yeah. I actually, I guess, begrudgingly admire. But I'm like, because you're doing this, nobody else can. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> well, the best part too is when multiple people are trying to oh, do it. Man. And it's very That's obvious awful. that there's like overlap happening. So you've got these jokes coming from this other YouTuber in the background of this one guy that's yelling oh. at the screen. Like, I would have to tap somebody on the shoulder and be like, dude, you can't. Yeah. You can't do that. Yeah. I mean, I think they, well, they, they sort of like encouraged it at the same time, but God, it's just, it's, it doesn't work. It's kind of gross. It doesn't work, man. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, in a, in a nutshell, to get back to the, the main point of this story is that I, I think we're all in agreement that we're glad that review events are sort of not happening as much anymore. I think we're glad that the, uh, the, the integrity of the review remains stalwart. For now. And faithlessness. Yes. <laughs> God. We have to tell people what's going on with that so we can't just keep calling back to it with no base. Uh, we're just ripping on the fact that the, I, I just learned this today. Apparently, the uh, the next Star Ocean game is going to be called Star Ocean Integrity and Faithlessness. Really? I thought yeah. we had talked about it on this show before. I don't but think I we did. a conversation that I had with Rob or I, I, I feel like I definitely would have remembered that. I like Star Ocean games. I'm not trying to be a, yeah. a naysayer there. Like, I loved uh, the second story on my PS1, but uh, it was just a shock. <laughs> it's just a weird Right name, up there with man. the next Kingdom Hearts. Yeah. Star Ocean Integrity and Faithlessness will be a PS3, PS4 release in 2016. If you were curious, there you go. That's that's news, too. Ah, oh boy. Best segue ever. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, clouds in fucking Smash Bros, too, yeah. if, we wanna, if we want to touch yeah, on the yeah, yeah, hard-hitting yeah, news cool. there. Uh, what's your... Promotional event. Dude. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. What's your, uh, what's your one character you need in Smash Brothers that hasn't been included yet? One character that needs They got Linkle in there, so they, I'm good. yeah, there you go. You got Fuck your Linkle yeah. inclusion. Linkle's in. 
I don't care. You don't care? Not yeah, even a little bit. I really like. I. I don't know, Put man. Solid speak <laughs> back in. There's yeah. never been a time in Smash Bros. where I'm like, I'm playing this character because I like this character. It's always been like, I I enjoy their play style. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I play mostly as like King DDD. And yeah, sure, like I've beaten Kirby on Game Boy like four times ten years ago. But I'm not like, oh man, they better put Mr. Rossetti as a playable character or I'm going to mm-hmm. be mad. Am I the only one that likes to uh, look at the competitive meta of characters that are currently being used? Like, you know, you don't, you don't really pay that, pay that much attention to it when you're playing with friends or stuff. But you have a general idea of the characters that people just don't use. And you pick that character because you want to make it work. And you want to show everyone right. that, like, you know, every character can be played. I'm better than the pros. Yeah. <laughs> the only reason Mr. Game & Watch doesn't get enough cycling through the pro circuit is because people don't try him out, you know? Like, you gotta give him his honest day's effort. All you gotta do is get a 9 on the hammer, and it's like an instant <laughs> KO every time. And you haven't seen this frying pan move used by an actual professional. I'll show you how it's done. No, I, I, uh, I, don't, I don't care either. <laughs> it's, it's all just... Uh, I, I don't know why it's such a big deal. Like, people freak the fuck out over it. Cloud they is in Smash Cloud. Bros. The world is ending. I have had to, uh, I've had to take a step back from the Nintendo community. It's gotten mm. like it's it's undertailed a little bit, and I can't. I can't <laughs> oh, crack that's a shell. verb now. That. Oh no, yeah. that, oh that's so the, true. The Nintendo. You opened up a can of worms. I dare <laughs> not, not that talk. That word. About. <laughs> I I really I like most Nintendo games. Yeah. Kate and I played the new Animal Crossing like board game this weekend. I wasn't. And. Was a little... oh, and yeah. um, mm. I but I, I kind of can't get into it because you're like, hey guys, I like Smash Bros. And they're like, fucking, you know, they don't blah blah, you, the amiibo uh, cloud does. Uh, but I'm like, man, I, I, you get those I, I wish they'd ball. stop yelling those slurs at you like that, those man. Random That's words good. that don't even make sense. <laughs> you get the smash ball and then you press the B button and you do a cool move. And, uh, you get the mm-hmm. smash ball in, you press mm-hmm. the B button out. And... It's like mm-hmm. a little too... Uh, it's too. The, the community is too in love with it right now that I can't... Uh, it's a little overwhelming, yeah. Man. Yeah. Well... I don't give a shit. Thank you, Mathis. It's time for everybody's favorite segment, <laughs> Ask Roundtable. <laughs> Uh, you can send your questions into roundtableyt at gmail.com if you got a question. This one comes from Peter. Peter so wants Peter. to know, uh, hello guys, my question is, what is your opinion, or what in your opinion would be the best movie slash book slash comic slash game franchise uh, that Telltale could pick up? You'll remember uh, Telltale Games as the company behind such games as The Walking Dead and uh, the Game of Thrones narrative as well as yeah. Minecraft Story Mode. Uh, we're talking either serious, no right answer decisions, Walking Dead style, or, you know, lighthearted, witty dialogue like in Tales from the Borderlands. Uh, so, more or less the question from Peter. Thank you very much, Peter, for the question. Uh, what do you want to have telltale We'll start with uh, We'll start with Nick. Yeah, mine's super easy. I've actually said this publicly before. I think Doctor Who would be the absolute perfect match for mm-hmm. them. I agree with you 100%. It's the perfect mix yeah. of witty dialogue, <laughs> right. serious... I- <laughs> Look, it's an honest answer. No, I, He's hanging I, himself <laughs> over my saying Doctor We're Who. We're picking so many fan I'm bases so to upset like based Doctor on Who. your reaction to Doctor things. Who is, <laughs> Nick, don't worry, I'm with you. Doctor Who is fantastic. Yeah. I uh, I don't. I also don't <laughs> particularly care for Doctor Who, to be perfectly honest with you. But uh, That's fine. I don't mind if you don't care. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah, no, no. You I, hang yourself over it. <laughs> So, oh no, did, did, did we freeze frame him again, but in a uh, much less flattering position? Uh, no, nope, okay, he's there. Can. He's good. <laughs> uh, so, I, I'm kind of in agreement with you there, honestly. I think, despite the fact that I am not really the biggest Doctor Who fan, I think the Doctor Who Telltale game would probably do quite well. Uh, I, I mean, they've done so many of them already that I totally didn't even expect. I'm sort of just looking for one that would be totally out of left field, you know? Like, I was not expecting a Tales from the Borderlands game. Were you guys? Like, that one was just... No. Totally blew me away. And I didn't expect Minecraft either. Minecraft, I maybe expected a little more. I think I expected Minecraft way more than I expected Borderlands. Telltale Breaking Bad. Telltale Breaking Bad. Look it up. I want to see suggestions. Telltale Breaking Bad could be okay. I agree. I wasn't kidding. (laughs) I'm gonna I'm gonna try to pull chat suggestions here actually because I may not even have that good of an answer for you. What's your your answer? uh, Telltale Bob Ross. Telltale Bob Ross, sure. Uh, I like the Telltale Hunger Games one, actually. Ah, I could see that as well. That could Mm -hmm. be cool. 
I, I, that new movie's coming out on fucking Friday, man. Apparently, I just Ooh. do not consume media anymore because I had no idea that was even a thing. I, uh, I don't know if it's that. I mean, I know it's big, but mm -hmm. I think I feel like it's kind of been superseded by other phenomenon now. Mm -hmm. It tried to Tomb Raider its way into the main releases of the year. It was just like it's it's gone on too long. It's mm -hmm. like expecting me to care about something that is not a member of my family for like four years is just is too much. That's a good rule of thumb. Uh, That's like... an undergraduate degree. You've asked me to care <laughs> about the Hunger Games franchise long enough to get a bachelor's in something. Mm. Like, you got a uh, you got a series you want to tell Ryan? The Hunger Games. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was actually I was thinking Breaking Bad would be cool. Yeah, but but um, I would also like to see Telltale do something sci-fi, mm -hmm. which is not me. I guess Borderlands is sci-fi, but. Um, in an established yeah. universe. I'm not necessarily saying Star Wars or Star Firefly. Trek. But, um, that could be cool, yeah. Um, so mm. Something along those lines. Or maybe like a, like a Telltale Fargo. Something like that. Oh, man. Telltale Django. Solid. I would love that. You've actually, Both you've of actually those, nailed, actually. You actually nailed exactly what I want. I, um, I, I remember when they announced, before they announced they were working on uh, Game of Thrones, all they said is they've, they've got their dream project. I was like, oh my god, what could it be? And the one I was hoping for was Star Wars. Hmm. I would love to see them do a Star Wars thing because the choices you have, you could like have like force power options. What do you want to do? Like force persuade, oh, choke him, just talk to him. Come on. It'd yeah. be awesome. I would you know love it's going to end Wars the same story. way it did in every other Star Wars game. It's a freaking black white morality system. I don't care about morality. Just give me my okay. options to force Yo, choke him. I bitch. know the Death Star didn't work last time, but hear me out. <laughs> What if but that's we built the another Death Star? Do you realize that is the Force Awakens? <laughs> that's what I mean. They show that like star station, uh, in the background. Uh, star killer base yeah. in the background. Yeah, dude. You're Force like, Awakens well. one is still really good. I think Force Awakens two is garbage, <laughs> or Force Unleashed. I mean, yeah, there you go. Force Unleashed two was awful. It's it was one of the so worst bad. games I've ever played. It was at least it was, was only solid. three hours. And yeah, you're done. Don't prolong the suffering. Ugh. <laughs> suffering. Well, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for the question. Again, you can send your questions into uh, roundtableyt at gmail.com if you've got a question for Ask Roundtable. I do want to mention, too, he, uh, he, he recommended I check out... Uh, he said, if you want an interesting time travel game, because I was talking about uh, wanting to make my own time travel game in that Ask Roundtable seg segment last week, uh, he recommended I check out Shadow of Destiny, a Japanese yeah. PS2 adventure game. Uh, I remember I did play that game. I remember it very vividly now. I played Shadow of Destiny on the PS2. It came out in like 2003. Uh, the, I'm looking at the plot for it now. I'm trying to remember what happened. And I don't want to... Okay, I'm going to spoil the entire plot for Shadow of Destiny on the oh, PlayStation 2. I want to no! give you guys a warning for that right now. I'm sorry. Uh, it's set in a fictional German town named uh, Leb Lebensbaum which means life's, life's tree. Uh, it was originally called oh, yeah. Shadow of Memories in Japan. It was changed to Shadow of Destiny for some reason in North America because I, just destiny is more approachable than destiny. memories, maybe. But uh, the 22-year-old the protagonist dies in the beginning of the game from being stabbed after leaving a diner. It's like Ghost. Yeah. yeah. No, just it, instantly. It's just like, boom, you're dead. And then you're right into the clay pot scene. Mm-hmm. But there's yeah, there's yeah. like eight endings for it, which I was amazed by. Like I th uh, that was that was pretty cool back in the day. Like I I remember thinking, man, there's like all kinds of shit can happen in this. This is wild. This is the most this is the most ambitious title of all time. Ten out of ten. Yeah. Ten. Mm -hmm. That was it. It's a really high score. Yeah, it was really good. Now time for everybody's favorite segment after their favorite segment. It's Nick's weird games. What's Wait up? What's up? What's up? What? What? You talking about Shadow of Destiny or Shadow of Memories? No, that's what I said. They they called it Shadow of Memories in Japan, but Shadow of Destiny in North America. That's the that's where the confusion lay. Good. I was just testing you. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> A PSP version was released in 2009. If you want to know that, they can play my PSP. That's right. Pest oh, are uh... pretty small penis. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> It's time for Nick's Weird Games. Uh, every week, Nick picks a weird game from his catalog of very weird games. We try to guess it. We allow Twitch chat to try to guess as well. If you think you know the game, uh, feel free to shout it out in chat. And we'll try to grab your name from there and shout you out. And uh, this week's Nick's Weird Game theme song, routinely performed by Ryan Norton Lyle Letourneau, 
<laughs> what are we uh, What are we looking for? I don't know. I, I I got nothing, man. What do you want? What do you want? You artist pick anything? Anything? You to, just dive in. You know? Just host the show next <laughs> week, and then uh, <laughs> maybe you'll get up on time. Right? Yeah. One. That's valid. <laughs> um, I don't know. What's um, what's popular with the kids these days? What's on fleek, man? Four, I'm learning on like, fleek is a thing people insane. say. They by, say like, it. What is it? 14 Carat by Selena Gomez? I don't know this one. How about a little bit of... Uh, let's go uh, Let's go like with the fucking mamas and the papas. Can you pull that off? That's just like the, you know, like... Yeah, oh, I know yeah. California Dreaming. Man. Yeah, mm-hmm. Oh, you look. You, I, I feel like you want this one, but I don't yeah, know. Yeah, no. I, there, there's a <laughs> there's a line I've found that I could take. All yeah. Right. Okay. Nick, go. you gotta go get the game, man. Here we go. All right. I was waiting. Okay, that would be like, all the games are all the games are bad, and the publisher died, and the publisher died. <laughs> Nick's got a weird. Nick's got a yeah. weird game. That he, we will try, <laughs> that we will try. It came out in the early 2000s or the late 90s or the <laughs> late 90s. Okay, yeah. that's basically. That yeah. was good. No, I like that a lot, man. You got to know the mamas and the papas to get to appreciate that one. But yeah, that, that was. Yeah. That one, that one was nice. All right. Hey, guys. What you do you got for us, Nick? Games? Yes, I do. All right. I've got a PS2 game for you today. Yeah. Back to that again. It's a pretty easy one. I think your chances of this are fairly high that you'll get it. Uh, you will be dissuaded when I say who the developer is, though, because I think you won't know a clue who they are. All right. uh, okay. uh, developed by Swing and Ape Studios. No idea who they are. No idea. <laughs> Swing and Ape. <laughs> Swing and Ape Studios. Donkey Kong Island tro or Tropical Island on the uh, Nintendo DS. Published by Vivendi Universal and Sierra Entertainment. Came out okay. on the GameCube, PS2, Xbox, and apparently the Xbox 360, although I'm not exactly sure how. What year um, was this? This came out in North America in 2003. Okay. It is a third-person action shooter, and it features a robot. Pause. Anybody? Mm, keep going. Okay. Uh, follows a robot that I can't say his name. Good oh, catch. Good yeah. catch. <laughs> <laughs> that might what be... Oh, is it, is, it, uh, is it choppy? No, no, it's not Choppy. I don't what, know what that is. Robo? Chappie? No, Chappy. Yeah, Chappy. Chappy that's the one. Chappy. Chappy. <laughs> <laughs> he joins forces with some droids in a fight against General Corrosive and the Millbots. Is this metal arms a glitch in the system? Ding! Ooh, we have a winner, boys. Nice. Ryan's well got done. Me. Metal that's arms. That's an underrated classic. You know, Josh loves that game. Wow. Quite a few people do, actually, and I, it came out around when Ratchet and Clank did, and actually got quite a bit of positive press, only it just sort of went away for some reason, and there was, I don't think, ever a follow-up on it for, again, whatever reason. But one, more, one more time, give me the box art on there. One more time, sure. Yeah. There you go. Oh, the ah, robot. Yeah. I like that. He, he looks a little bit like Chappy, doesn't he? Yeah. Just yeah. a little bit. He does, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, close. This is our first one here. And oh, we got that in chat. Well done, no, man. That's one way up, actually. That's one of those rare occasions, I think, where we might have we might have even gotten it before chat did, honestly. So Disco Werfel, I think, might be the first person. Wait, no, there's another one up above that. Mm -hmm. uh, Resner. Resner. Well done, is Resner. Is the first one I see. Well done. That All right. Is my first uh, Nick's weird game ever, I think. Yeah, yeah you gotta tell me. Uh, you gotta tell me how you got that one. What's your history with? With this game. I would, had a lot of subscriptions to gaming magazines in like 2003 to 2004. Okay. That's also, fair. Josh really liked Metal Arms. So he was talking about Metal Arms from time to time. Mm. We knew each other back then. Apparently, it came out on Xbox 360 through their backwards compatible thing that launched in that makes 2008. Sense. Oh, yeah. Okay. There we go. That makes sense. Because I was like, what? It, me. There's no way they like remastered Metal Arms. Yeah, no, I didn't think they did either. <laughs> so when I saw that, I was a little confused. I almost didn't say it at all because it yeah. might have screwed up the whole thing. Yeah. What was the what's the robot's name that you said you couldn't say? Glitch. 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 Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, glitch in the system yeah. is the title of the game. So. Okay. Right. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, that is Nick's Weird Games. Uh, we still have, by the way, the option, if you'd like to do so, of uh, the P.O. box Nick's got set up. So if you've got a weird game that you want Nick to uh, showcase on this segment, feel free to send that over. Uh, also, of course, ask Roundtable. You get roundtableyt at gmail.com. And uh, that is our show for today. Hope you guys Woo! enjoyed it.
We're gonna go probably play more Fallout Four at a wager if we're half yeah, of us. Yeah, one more one more day of Fallout <laughs> week today, so I gotta stream that. Ah, uh, yeah. There you go. Uh, uh, thank you guys very much for tuning in. This is uh, ideally, you know, again, the uh, the start time we're looking for for the show around, let's go between 11 and 11.30 Pacific Standard Time uh, here on the Roundtable Twitch account. This is twitch.tv slash roundtable podcast. Still available, of course, on YouTube and SoundCloud as well. If you miss the live show, you can always catch the entire VOD either in video form or in audio form on SoundCloud or iTunes as well. We're still on iTunes, still uploading every single show over there on iTunes. Uh, feel free to rate the show five stars if you enjoy it. We want to thank our patron supporters for this uh, week's show. You can go over to patreon.com slash roundtable as well. Still running the Patreon page in addition to the uh, Twitch subscription model we've got going on for the channel now, which uh, is closing in on actually that uh, sub goal, which I guess I should be promoting if we want to get the rest of those emotes unlocked. Uh, we are we got to get up to 25, so you know, and, and no, obviously no pressure at all whatsoever to do that, but if we want more emotes, there's that. Uh, thank you very much for our Patreon supporters for this week's show. That is including, but not limited to, Max Pillen, uh, Positron, Christopher Flagg, Alexander Spillman, Jonathan Graham, Julian Avelsgaard, Kevin Berklin, Matt, David Bradley, Air Force Balls, General Krug, Casey, Zur, Simph, Kevin Walker, Ignacio0891, Bristle Brip, uh, Justin, Vandervet, Logan Ray, Samurfet, T Page Tenner, Matthew Monahan, Adam, Adam Savage's Blowhole, Johannes Goldhahn, Mediocrities, Nolref, and Myth Scarab. Thank you guys very much for continuing to support the show, and thank you all very much for watching today's episode of Roundtable Live. You can catch the VOD again later on today over on YouTube.com slash BearTaffy. But uh, that is going to do it. Thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Later.